3.16 and John 3.17. And I chose both of them because everybody knows John 3.16. Well, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. But it's often not followed up by 3.17, which I think is actually the most important part of that particular scripture. When you look at it, this is from the, the American the Bible in English, which stays about in English. It says, For God loved the world so much that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not die but have eternal life. Verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to be its judge, but to be its savior. And I think it's interesting that uh, he would uh, continue teaching. He said he's in the process of teaching uh, a high-ranked Jewish official, Nicodemus, about uh, the afterlife, about uh, things that are that are needed and necessary to get to heaven. And Nicodemus is, is a great Jewish leader, a uh, great Jewish leader. He's uh, probably considered one of the most educated men in the world at that time. And he's a scholar, teacher, and uh, he's here speaking to this basically young upstart. And Jesus, again, barely 30 years old, probably half his age. And he's learning from Jesus. And uh, Jesus is talking to him like he's a kid. He said, you are a great teacher in Israel and you don't know things like this. I'm telling you the truth. We speak of what we know and report what we have seen, yet none of you is willing to hear the news. You do not believe me when I tell you about things of this world, so how will you ever believe me then when I tell you about the kingdom of heaven? And no one has ever gone up to heaven except the Son of Man who came down from heaven. I think we should know these things. He does know these things. But to hear this type of words from a young man that is a rabbi but not a scholar probably set him back a few years. And then Jesus came up with, For God so loved the world so much that he gave his only son. And maybe he was probably very, very surprised. Because he was hoping, deep in his heart, hoping that this was the one that would be the Messiah. And later, after the crucifixion, Nicodemus proved, his, proved himself worthy of, of the cross by taking Jesus' body in and helping to entomb it, showing his belief in him. But now, I want to talk about whosoever. Whosoever is a big word when you consider all the possibilities of all people in the world. Whosoever. You see, it says, whoever believes in the Son, in the Son, this is verse 18, whoever believes in the Son is not judged. How about that? So this next, and then it says, but who does not believe has already been. Because he has not believed in God's only Son. This, you know, I hear a lot of people talk about the fact they believe in God. They believe in God. They think that there is a higher being in the universe. That there, there's a there's a spiritual spiritual being that has helped to create or has created everything. And they, they just say, I, you know, I believe in God. And they have to ask the question, well, that's fine, you believe in God, but do you believe in Jesus? Or oh, I, I think Jesus was a great prophet. Or maybe uh, Jesus was, well, you know, they say he was the son of God, but you know, God's not a physical thing, so I don't know how he could be God's son. And uh, there are lots of people that believe in God, truly believe in God, but they forgot the important part of the, of the mixture. They've forgotten to believe in Christ.
Jesus is uh, the one that God sent into the world to save it. And Jesus is the one that says we need to believe in him. Well, who believes in the Son will not be judged. But who does not believe has already been judged. To me, uh, I mean, there are religious factions in the world that talk about moral sin. Uh, like in the Catholics, if you commit suicide, it's a moral sin. You can never be forgiven. Uh, people say that no, nobody should ever be forgiven for murder or for rape or, or for you know heinous crimes like the terrorism, where you kill hundreds of people at a time, thousands of people. Uh, these are things that people think are unforgivable sins. But uh, there's only one in the Bible that's spoken of that I could ever find that is truly unforgivable. And that's, you don't believe in Jesus Christ. You can believe in God, like I said. No. Three quarters of the population of the earth believes in some form of deity, some form of God. The Muslims have Allah. Hindus, they, they believe in Buddha in the seven stages of life, whatever, whatever that is. The Baha'i believe in the and the, the different stages of life reincarnation until you become God, uh, which is an interesting concept. Crazy, interesting. Uh, there's lots of religions. Hindus, uh, they, they're different in the sense that they believe that the earth is tied, that everything is tied to the earth. And if I, if I were going to have a religion outside of Christianity, that might be the one that I would embrace because I'm a I'm a great earth guy. I like, I like everything on the earth, and, uh, especially the stuff that I can eat from. You know, beer and uh, the fish, all the vegetables and plants and stuff that you can eat. I, mean, I, I get into that earth religion, but uh, I just don't think that it holds a lot of merit when you compare it to the glories and the, the great gifts that we receive from our Heavenly Father. Jesus. Uh... 
says that I am the only way. No one enters the kingdom except through me. And uh, one guy who was apparently a pastor for many, many, many years said that he could not stop crying when he read that. Because it alienated so many people in the world. And I thought to myself, you're supposed to be a pastor. You're supposed to know that. You're supposed to realize that this is what we're supposed to be preaching. That Jesus is the way to the kingdom of heaven. Not uh, <laughs> Not by the good deeds you do, not by the acts of kindness that you commit, not by how many people you help or are in it. I mean, who's keeping score anyway? It's by your faith, and your love, and your devotion to Jesus Christ that you go to heaven. It's because of your belief in God that He has led you to Christ that has developed this sense of awe and wonder. And me, for sure, it should be for everybody else. That there was someone so much in love with us that they would give their only son as a sacrifice. As a sacrifice. And to me, that is a terrible, terrible word. Sacrifice reminds me of, uh, of the pagan rituals and uh, the things that were going on in England when they would take babies and slaughter them. And, and, uh, the killing of the sheep and the rams and the bulls on the altar to appease a, a God that was an angry God. But he says that his greatest and only sacrifice he wants from us is our love, our devotion. Because he's going to give us everything else we need. He's giving us his son to take care of our sins. He's giving us his son so that we don't have to be judged. He's given us His Son so that we are saved and He is the Savior of the world. He has made it possible for us to be righteous, pure, cleaner than we've ever been. And all I can do is say, Jesus, come to my heart. Let me be the next person for you. I want to be yours. We have to remember that we're His in the first place. God created us. He said, let us make man in our image. And, if, and after our likeness, we're, I mean, not very good package, but I'm a package of God. There's lots of prettier packages in here than I am, but we're all Form in the shape of God. He has arms and legs. I assume when he says that they can make our image, I assume that he has arms and legs and head and eyes and mouth and nose. They're probably flawless. Perfect example of what a human being should be because he's not. Perfect example of what any being.
generated by hate. The devil was behind it. So we, we can take that to the bank. The devil is at work in this world to keep us from Jesus Christ. But we have the ability, we have the uh, honor, we have the duty to stand up to these things and say, listen, this is enough. Enough is enough. I have a breakfast group that we meet every Thursday and uh, we pray for each other and have a, have a nice meal, just enjoy each other's company. And then sometimes we go out and play golf together or whatever. But we got a black man in this group. He's a dear friend of mine, just a fantastic guy. Uh, I've told him a couple of times whenever I, if I pass away before he does, he's going to preach at my funeral. Because he's just an outstanding, outstanding deacon in this church and uh, he's, uh, he's one of the elders of the church and, and is just a fantastic speaker and a wonderful man. Uh, we talk all the time about the prejudice in the world uh, and, uh, and he is taken aback as much as we are because he's, you know, Jackson is, a, is kind of a notorious community for uh, street shootings and uh, drive-bys and things like that. But he's been in an active ministry for over 20 years now where they're bringing kids in off the streets into their church, the Oasis of Love, Full Gospel Church on uh, Airline Drive. And they take these kids in during the, during the school year. Sometimes they'll have them in there for breakfast and they'll have them for dinner afterwards. It's the, maybe the only meals they get in the day. They do young men retreats. They take these young guys off the streets and they take them to a secluded area for a weekend and preach to them all weekend about what it is to be a man, what it is to be a husband or a father. And I mean, these are 16, 17, 18, 15-year-old you know, kids, teenagers, most of them. They have no idea because they've never been taught because they don't have dads at home. And he's, he told me amazing statistics about the black community in Jackson, two-thirds of all blacks in Jackson, the households are fatherless, two-thirds. That like 90% of the kids that are taken in to custody by the police are from fatherless homes. To me, that's, that's an amazing, just amazing, I can't understand it. I, I have a problem grasping that concept because I had a gracious, loving father that was there for me all the time. And I have been married to Nancy now for 44 years. And we've always been there for our girls. And I never, and Nancy's mom and dad were married for, for 45 years before Bob passed away. And it's just, we don't know the concept of having a fatherless home. So it, it was really hard for me to grasp it. Then he invited me to the church one day for a men's revival, and I went over there with him, and there was about 40 men total. And I stood out like a sore thumb. It was the only pipe guy in this room. But gracious, generous, healthy men that had made the commitment to, although they, they might not have children of their own, they had made the commitment to work with these kids and try to help them get through. So it was like a, a big brothers convention for the black community of Jackson. And I was just awestruck. I, I couldn't understand, I, I just couldn't grasp the concept of so many men willing to do what they were doing. And all I hear about on TV is the bad things that are happening. We don't hear anything about you know, 35 or 40 black men running together to teach two or 300 teenage youth, what it is to be a man, what it is to be a husband, a father, a grandfather. You don't hear stories like that. But that's the stories that we get through the grace of God. Because one person will reach out to another and they'll talk about it. And we will see God's love coming down through the sacrifice of Christ into the lives of true Christians, the ones that speak the truth. And that's what he's talking about here. Those who speak the truth, do not hide their light. They bring it out so that God, so that everybody will see that it is an obedience to God.
That's why they're doing it. Because they're obeying God's word. They're talking to their kids, they're talking to their their wives, their mothers, their fathers. They're out on the street recruiting these young men to come in and learn what life is all about. Instead of being out on the street in gangs or, or chasing a Pokemon around the corner. <laughs> My, my favorite is Candy Pop. You know, all have favorite games. But it's, there are things going on in this world that are so good and uh, so wonderful. And I'm proud to be involved in them just a little way. Uh, when I get a chance to work with uh, probably four or five times a year, I work with anywhere from 30 to 50 kids when we do the hunter's training, hunter's safety training. I mean, it's, it's not a religious organization or anything like that. It's just uh, teaching them about firearm safety, about how to properly use a bow and arrow, how to properly use a shotgun or a rifle and stuff like that, how to be safe when you're out in the field. But it's volunteer work that I enjoy doing. I get certified through the Department of Natural Resources. I can train people with all these firearms. And it, it's a good feeling when the kid will take the test and they got to pass the test. And, uh, but a really good feeling when they take the test and then you get a classroom full of people that all got AIDS. <coughs> that shows you that you've done a good job when you uh, train them and, and taught them the way that they should be taught. So they know firearm safety, they know safety out in the field, they know certain survival techniques so that they won't get hurt if they're out in the field or if they do get hurt how they can find their way back home, they know the international signal of distress, they know how to they know how to do things that they might not have known if they're not taken the firearm safety class. And uh, it makes you feel good that you've done something to, to the community, to help the community. I, I don't know how, much rather see kids out in the woods with their parents knowing what they're supposed to be doing than going out for the first time and the dad you uh, sit there and wait, and not when we're there. I've, had, I've seen that happen many times. It's seen the disastrous consequences of it, too. Getting out, doing something that you like or you love so that you can touch the community is a Christian way of doing things. And that's what these, these uh, gentlemen from the Noise and Love are doing. So I feel that's what I'm doing when I do the, the hunter safety classes. Anybody that works in a food bank, there's two or three different uh, thrift stores that are run by uh, religious organizations and check. Anything like that that helps, that's showing your obedience to God. It's letting your light shine upon the hill. That's accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior and saying, okay, I'm yours. That's when we really begin to enjoy life. I am the only happy guy. I've been happy all my life. But I'm never more happy than when I'm serving somebody. When I'm doing something for somebody that makes them feel good. Because it makes me feel good. It really makes me feel good. So I'd like to end with just a reminder. And there's no way to better remind people than to just say this. Verse 17. For God did not send his son to the world to be its judge, but to be its savior. Amen. Amen.